So it's a great pleasure and privilege to have a chance to talk to Stanley Wong. Um, Stanley, I was asked by start by asking when and where were you born? Mm -hmm. I was born in 1956 in Hong Kong uh, to Chinese parents. Mm -hmm. My parents came from Guangzhou mm -hmm. in China to Hong Kong, 1951. Mm -hmm. I, I remember a single thing, I mean, um, my father, mm -hmm. so very proud of that fact. He told us, uh, he came on the day in 1951 with only the day's papers, in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> and then he started, he, he used to be a shoemaker mm -hmm. in Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. So he started a factory, uh, very typical in those days, uh, a home factory, mm -hmm. uh, making shoes. He had several, I've forgotten exactly how many um, sort of disciples the people learning the trade mm. under him. Apprentices, uh, yes. Yeah, and then he had also uh, his siblings, my mm. uncles and uh, aunties, working uh, together. Why did they leave China? It's mainly because for uh, economic uh, reasons, because mm. it's very poor mm. uh, in those days in uh, Guangzhou. Mm. And then I think by the time he left, um, the economy was so bad mm. that he, he couldn't survive. Uh, so he, had, he, he was told that there's more opportunity uh, mm. in Hong Kong. So he came. Yeah. yeah. And do you know anything about your relatives before that? Do you know about his parents? Yes. My grandparents, um, my grandfather, um, how do I describe it? It's... it's uh, in Chinese, it's called uh, the rich second generation. Mm -hmm. But but it's a kind of very ironic. Uh, I was told that my grandfather's father mm -hmm. was the gang leader of the uh, beggars mm -hmm. uh, in, in Guangzhou. <laughs> so, well, in fact, beggars um, mm -hmm. in a group in a gang, if mm. it became, became quite uh, mm. well to do, mm. well, not not actually rich. Mm. So my grandfather didn't have to do anything. So mm. he just sat there and enjoy life. <laughs> <laughs> and and so he was quite rich, but he, uh, his son was not so rich. He was second generation. Yes, it's, it's the um, well effects of the wars. Mm. Uh, and and of the general turmoil mm. of the time, I suppose. Yeah. So your father lived through the Japanese invasion and yeah, so on. Yeah, in Guangzhou. Did he ever talk about that? No, no. Perhaps it's so bitter. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. And what about your mother? My mother, again, very typical. Uh, she worked in um, garden. Mm. Her father was a sort of florist, mm. were growing uh, marketable uh, flowers, uh, so he worked in the fields. Mm. Uh, I think she married my father when she was hardly 18, yeah, quite common in those days. So uh, they married in China? Yes, in Guangzhou. Mm. Yeah. And then they both came uh, to Hong Kong. So my mother worked in the in the kitchen in the oh. home factory, mm. uh, feeding a lot of mouths, including mm. ourselves. So what I remember, <clears throat> very early days, the very poor uh, situation, the hardly enough to uh, eat every day in Hong Kong. Yes, in the early fifties, mm. um, we had. Five, I think I, I have four other siblings. Mm. Uh, my younger, <clears throat> sorry, my elder brother, uh, my elder sister, myself, and the two younger brothers. Mm. Uh, different, born different times, mm. of course, uh, but we all lived together mm. in in a kind of very typical uh, old building mm. on Shanghai Street. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Three-story, 
<clears throat> we live on the top floor. Mm. Now, ten families, more or less. So you mm. all lived in one or two rooms. In uh, we we were lucky because we had the balcony, mm. sort of all windows, mm. fronting the, uh, Shanghai Street. Mm. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, natural light, mm. but not the other families. They sort of live mm. inside of the um, mm. apartment. And we had just one kitchen, which doubled up as the toilet, <laughs> <laughs> and no flushing toilet in those mm. days. And this was for your family or for all the family? For all of them. Mm. So we got to share the kitchen and, and it gave rise to some quarrels and <laughs> Mm. So different, I mean, everybody's got to share everything else, including water supply. You said that you, you were, people were very hungry. and we, Do you remember being hungry? Yes. Yes. Because mm. we had, I mean, my mother had to feed about 10 people in a meal. So what she got from the market, and mm. that's it. Rice in those days was plentiful. Mm. but not the uh, other foodstuff. Uh, vegetable and fish also good, mm. but not meat. Mm. Uh, chicken, <clears throat> strangely, in those days uh, considered to be a very valuable mm. thing. So we seldom had, mm, perhaps not even once a month, mm. we had chicken, or well, let alone beef, mm. very seldom, mm. sometimes pork but mostly uh, vegetable and fish. Yeah. Mm. How, big, how big was Hong Kong then? I mean, the population of Hong Kong. In the 60s, we started with, uh, I mean, the early 60s, mm -hmm. we started with about 3 million people. Mm. Uh, Quite uh, big. Mm. Yeah, apparently uh, boasted by the uh, emigration from China, mm. the very poor days of the great live forward. Mm and uh, famine and so on. Yeah. What is your first memory um, oh, in your childhood? Looking out of the window mm. from my apartment, so to mm. speak, uh, across the street, mm. Shanghai Street, to the other apartments across the street. That, that was, I think, one oh. of the very early memories. Mm. Yeah. Not a very sunny day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, w when did you first go to school and where? Uh, <clears throat> we call it kindergarten. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, well, strangely enough, it's, it's an Anglican church mm. called All Saints. Mm. Uh, they operate uh, secondary, primary school mm -hmm. as well as a kindergarten. So, I think I went there at the age of three, mm -hmm. about 10 minutes walk. Mm. from where we lived. Yeah. And, and was it an English medium school? No, no, not, not the kindergarten. Uh, <clears throat> but I think they started teaching English uh, from primary school. Mm. Yeah, I, I so still... it was ca Cantonese? Yes, Cantonese mainly. Mm. Mm. I remember started off learning the alphabet. Mm. And with this typical um, textbook, mm. Uh, I think widely used in, in Southeast Asia, mm. in the uh, British uh, colonies, mm. uh, Malaysia, for example, Singapore. Mm. I think later on I found that out. I mean, we all mm. had <laughs> the same textbook, mm. learning English yeah. as a second language. Yeah. Did, you, did you enjoy that first kindergarten? Or? Uh, very vague memories. I, I, I sort of... I, I've lost it now. I used to have one photograph mm. of the class mm. with the teacher. Mm. Apparently, I mean, uh, very still very hard days. Uh, All Saints Church, I think in those days, again, very common. They dish out um, what I call it. I think I, I later on I found out it's, it's sort of milk powder mm. that diluted with water. Mm. So they gave that. Mm. alongside with crackers. Mm. So I remember after kindergarten, in fact, mm. uh, I was sort of the six years old. Mm. Well, in those days, they, they didn't have any sort of uh, discipline about children not wandering in the streets. So, <laughs> mm. 
we wander around with with the neighboring uh, mm. <clears throat> children, and then learning that they they have these um, goodies. Mm. Uh, so we went there. I remember that very vividly. Was it uh, safe? I mean, wandering? yes, yeah, yes, yes. So um, moving on to your next school, mm. um, was it again the church school? Uh, the <clears throat> the same uh, All Saints yeah. uh, primary school. Mm from primary one to five mm. uh, because we had at the end of primary six mm. some sort of exam public mm. exam got to take three subjects mm. uh, english chinese and mathematics mm. uh, by year five um, i failed in all of them <laughs> so uh, my teacher in fact well not me i think they told my parents that <clears throat> Uh, well, to, to be put it very bluntly, uh, your son's no longer wanted, <laughs> <laughs> so kick me out. <clears throat> so I, apparently my, my parents must have spent a lot of Guan, Guan Xi mm. uh, and time and effort to find me another school, mm. just across the railway line, because <clears throat> mm. All Saints is on the southern side, mm. and across the street is another sort of Taiwan background. <clears throat> uh, less known uh, mm. school mm. so they they uh, <clears throat> accepted me so i repeated primary five mm. and passed in that school ah interestingly you know, I had two very good teachers mm. one english uh, one chinese i mean teaching english mm. and teaching chinese uh, so perhaps i failed the uh, very miserably and then there was uh, scolded, <laughs> mm. uh, made up my mind. I mean, you've got mm. to uh, do good this time. Uh, mm. Second time round, you, mm. you won't have a third <laughs> chance. So I made up and then took the exam uh, after primary six. Got um, not top grades. I think the top mark was graded one. Mm. Uh, I have two uh, sort of very good friends, still mm. friends today. Uh, in the same class, um, <clears throat> one made all three ones. Mm. Uh, he's now a very famous, uh, well, perhaps retired uh, <clears throat> entrepreneur mm. in the United States, uh, mm. in the Silicon Valley. Um, my, he got all three ones. The other classmate uh, still in Hong Kong, uh, mm. one, one, two. Mm. Uh, I got all threes. Uh, sorry, all twos, mm. uh, three of the subjects. Mm. So I was assigned to uh, a secondary school, mm. uh, another sort of not Anglican, but but mm, sort of local Hong Kong, the <clears throat> what do you call it, uh, <clears throat> the adaptation mm. of the Anglican Church in mm. Hong Kong called Church of Christ in China. Mm. A school called Ying Hua College. Ying meaning English, yeah. Hua meaning Chinese. So, <clears throat> the <clears throat> Reverend Morrison oh, yes. started that in 1818 in Malacca and then moved the he college was a famous to famous man, wasn't yeah, he? Hong Kong, uh, 1843, I think, a year after uh, the British. Uh, came to Hong Kong mm. um, and then I went to that school in 1969 mm -hmm. started secondary one mm. and then went all the way to uh, secondary seven yeah. were, were things beginning to improve economically by then in Hong Kong? Uh, in the early 70s mm. still quite bad mm. up to about 73 the, the um, <clears throat> oil crisis yeah. It was still quite bad, <clears throat> but then began to pick up <clears throat> afterwards and getting better and better towards the end of the 70s. Mm. I think Hong Kong's the economy started to uh, take off in the 80s. Mm. Yeah. One of the little tigers or yes. dragons. Yeah. Um, were there any um, hobbies or mm. interests you had in those early days? Mm -hmm. Ah, 
that that is a decisive um, deciding deciding factor the converting to christianity now 1971 <clears throat> i was baptized in fact i've got a Mm. Your baptism certificate. <laughs> you can hold it up in front of you. <laughs> there. <laughs> a little higher. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then forgot to show some of these documents. Mm. This is uh, <clears throat> my vaccination certificate. Mm. I was barely two weeks old. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is one of my earliest pictures with my grandma. Mm. Uh, coming or going back to Guangzhou from Hong Kong, they got to issue as a re-entry mm. permit. Yeah, I was two years old. Nice. So, so, so um, <clears throat> you were fifteen or something mm -hmm. when you converted. Yes, I met through my elder sister, mm. uh, an American uh, <clears throat> missionary mm. called William Reed. Mm. from uh, Michigan. Mm. He came to, you know, to Hong Kong to teach English mm. and then start making contact with uh, his students that way yeah. and on the streets, uh, trying to uh, give them the gospel. Mm. So I, I <clears throat> happened to know him through mm. that, through my sister, yeah. and then went to church mm. in his home, in fact, mm. uh, and then started learning uh, the Bible Mm -hmm. and, and English, because and, and, he, he only spoke uh, English. Mm. So has that been important since then? Yes, uh, it, it made, the, well, as, as the Bible says, I mean, a new man. There's, mm. there's a different old perspective altogether to everything. I mean, to family, to life. and mm. to, tell, uh, tell me what the different perspective was. Well, we, we used to uh, sort of very ignorant. I mean about how how life came about, mm -hmm. uh, what family uh, are, are for, and so on. I mean, the, naturally the thinking was uh, trying to make most money mm -hmm. as much as possible, as quickly as possible. That that was was still true today. I mean the ethos in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but then the um, the teachings of the Bible changed all that. Mm. So you live don't you don't live by uh, bread alone, mm. uh, and then there is a, a spiritual side mm. to life, and of course the afterlife and eternal life. Mm. I mean it is a it's a total reverse mm. of of my own uh, thinking at the time. Mm. So it's quite um, <clears throat> quite life changing, mm. yeah. and it's still very important for you. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. So at school, in your secondary school, yeah. um, were there any subjects you particularly liked or in, uh, were good at? Uh, in the first three years, <clears throat> uh, they call Form 1, yeah. Form 2, Form 3, we, we got to do quite a lot of subjects. Hmm. I was quite attracted to the uh, literal side, hmm. the English, hmm. Chinese, uh, history, um, some of these uh, more attractive subjects mm. to me, uh, reading books, mm. but not the same uh, the science subjects. <coughs> I remember the first lesson, uh, chemistry. So the teacher was <coughs> writing all of these, um, what do you call it, uh, periodic table mm. uh, symbols on the blackboard. It's simply lost interest mm. and couldn't figure out uh, in, in a physics lesson, for example, mm. what, I mean, what, <laughs> what the teacher was talking about. There's simply no clue. Mm. So lost interest very quickly. Mm. And I, at the end of Form 3, I failed almost all of these science mm. subjects, except biology. Mm. Um, so at the end of Form 3, <clears throat> Uh, again, this is another turn, uh, important mm. life deciding uh, factor came along in the form of a Mr. Rex King, mm. uh, King's College uh, King. Mm. Uh, he came to, to be the new headmaster, mm. uh, the old one retired. 
and he he came from New Zealand, mm. perhaps from the New World. I'm not sure. He had a new way of doing things. He allowed、um, all the students at the end of Form Three to choose their majors、mm. for Form Four and Five, leading to、uh, like GCSEs,、yeah. called a school certificate exam in Hong Kong.、Um, I did quite well at the end of Form Three.、Um, we had about 160 students in four classes.、Mm. I came seventh. Mm. Uh, mainly because of my uh, uh, English Chinese uh, mm. Uh, grades, but、um, <clears throat> not the、mm. science. So in those days, I think still true today,、uh, students doing well, especially boys,、mm. would be expected to choose、uh, the science stream、mm. uh, in Hong Kong.、Um, but I gave everybody <clears throat> a surprise,、um, so. Mr. King called us one by one by our <clears throat> ranking.、Mm. So I was the seventh to stand、mm. up. All the six before me, of course, they chose to do the science stream.、Mm. I said arts,、mm. and more than that, there are two、uh, <clears throat> classes、mm. in、uh, form four arts.、Uh, arts one will, would be doing the English literature selective.、Mm. Uh, so I chose that. And that gave some <clears throat> quite a surprise to the rest of the、uh, my classmates,、uh, and then there was a great round of applause. <laughs> no doubt, I I I thought、uh, perhaps that they they think that they now have one more place、mm. in the science tree <laughs> to, <laughs> for them because it cuts off at about eighty.、Mm. Uh, so the、um, mm. if you came、uh, from the eightieth place onwards, that you won't be able to、mm. uh, go into the science tree. So that was quite decisive.、Mm. And then I carry on、um, to do very well,、mm. uh, GCSEs or, or the、mm. equivalent, and A levels.、Mm. I got a total of eight、uh, great A's,、mm. uh, five. Yes, five in、uh, GCSEs.、Mm. We we did、uh, a total of eight subjects.、Mm. I got five A's,、mm. uh, one B, and、mm. two E's.、Um, oh, sorry, two D's,、uh, and then all straight A's in the A levels.、Uh, I did English literature, history, and economic and public affairs, A levels. So you did very well,、yeah. and so that took you on to university. Yes. Well, before that, I'd like to mention another very special, unique experience.、Mm. Now, <clears throat> school certificate exam results,、mm. the announcement day. As expected, I I got very good grades. <clears throat> so perhaps Mr. King also expected this,、uh, that I would <clears throat> go on to do A levels English literature. I was the only one who got an A、mm. in the class. There were about a dozen or so、uh, classmates doing the same subject, A levels, with me.、Um, so I I went into his office, and well, he knew of course、uh, the results, and I asked him, not to his surprise, I like to carry on、mm. A levels, English literature, and other subjects, and then he just picked up the phone.、Mm. Uh, call the uh, next school,、uh, the school not next door, across the street, called Merino、uh, Convent School, a Catholic school,、uh, and the principal there called Sister Jean pick up the phone. I was there in the room, and <clears throat> to my surprise,、uh, I I I don't think they sort of rehearsed that before. <laughs> Sister Jean agreed、mm. without the second thought. Mm. Now okay, so Mr. Mr. King put down the phone and told me that, and then I was so thrilled.、Mm. Now, about twenty-five years later, I wrote a poem、mm. about this incident. I can show you, or in fact, I can give you a copy of yes, my little、copy. poem. <laughs> <laughs> the、uh, great memory、mm. of that day, and that again is it's another sort of deciding. 
factor because I went on to University of Hong Kong uh, doing English literature. This is the English University of Hong Kong. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So I picked up um, well, an Oxford poet, um, Gerard Manny Hopkins, mm -hmm. a Catholic. Yes. And in, in, well, in fact, it's A levels. I started learning about him. Mm. Um, the teacher at Marino, Sister Jean, mm. uh, in, his, uh, in her 70s, mm. I think in those days, he lived to 104, by the way. <laughs> he re uh, she retired uh, and went uh, back to America. Mm. I, I didn't have time to visit her before she died. Mm. But then my wife and I went to visit uh, Sister Jean uh, about 10 years ago. Mm. Uh, at Mary Knoll uh, in, in New York. Mm. Yeah. So you, you went on to read English yeah. at Hong Kong University. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is in the... Late 1976. 70s. Yeah, later 70s. Things are improving. Yes. Did you enjoy the university? <clears throat> now, two things come to mind. One is the... Um, very big times in China. We were um, very open. I mean, Hong Kong, we had access to international news. Mm. Um, and 1976 was a momentous year in China. Uh, I think in January of that year, there is this quick, quick earthquake mm. in China, Tang San. Mm. Uh, and that, of course, in the uh, tradition, uh, feng shui, <clears throat> that that would uh, tell you that, that something is of, going to happen. Yeah, yeah, something great is good. Well, no doubt. Yeah. And then I think in April or in February, Zhou Enlai died. Zhou Enlai or yeah. Chairman Mao? I think Chairman Mao died in September. All oh, right. Yeah, I think Zhao in February or April. Mm. And then in April, of course, this famous, I think April 21st, mm. the um, some sort of signs were, were sort of, uh, was displayed in uh, Tiananmen Square mm. uh, by certain people who, who tried to uh, ask the people to remember how good Zhao Mm. was in the Cultural Revolution and mm. so on and so on. Mm. And then that, well, of course, after the event, we learned that in, in even in those days, the Gang of Four yeah. were beginning to operate mm. uh, after Zhao died. Yeah. And then, of course, it's all history now, uh, leading to mm. uh, Chairman's death in September. And then the, the, the arrest mm. <clears throat> of the gang and so on. So we, we all watched that on TV in Hong Kong. Did you? The yeah. TV already? The trial yeah. of, mm. of the Gang of Four mm. on TV, Jiang Qing mm. particularly. What, mm. what was the attitude of your fellow students towards mainland China at that point? We, we had, no, I forgot to mention the other <clears throat> point, I said two. Mm. The other is the student uh, movement, mm. so to speak. Is is. Yeah, I think our perspective is more international because mm. uh, we, we were influenced quite a bit by the Western mm. idea of democracy and equality mm. and, and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, so we looked at the uh, Communist Party mm. in China under Chairman Mao mm. uh, with some uh, dismay. Mm. Uh, and then after the arrest of the Gang of Four, we thought that that would be the beginning mm. of a change. Mm. And of course, later on, we found out uh, when Deng Xiaoping mm. returned to power, and then that, that was it, uh, mm. a, a change in, in the whole outlook. Mm. Now, I, I, I don't think I was alone. I mean, we were like-minded students, we began to read a lot about the history of the Communist Party, mm. for example, Chairman Mao's thoughts mm. uh, and <clears throat> Deng Xiaoping's uh, writings, uh, particularly the, um, the clash mm. between the uh, philosophy mm. of uh, 
making sure that the economy works. Mm. That is the first priority. Uh, the famous saying, a cat is a good cat, mm. <laughs> irrespective of uh, its color. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of whether it can catch the mouse. Mm. So that, that went very deep into our heads. Mm. Uh, because that, that was what um, Hong Kong was doing. I mean, we, we never mind the uh, uh, philosophy or the whatever, uh, the teachings and so on. I mean, we got to uh, make ends meet mm. and feed. Uh, in the 70s, I think we were coming up close to 4 million people mm. uh, to give them housing, to feed people and so on. We, we were, um, I still remember, I mean... <clears throat> There, there were quite a lot of quite a lot of poverty still. Mm. Uh, squatter huts really? on rooftops, on the hillsides, and uh, a lot of fires. Um, although by the early seventies, uh, uh, the governor MacLeod started mm. 1972, I think, a huge uh, ten-year development program, mm. new uh, new towns. Uh, public housing, and beginning to show the uh, impact by the end of the 70s. Mm. Uh, the housing improvement, uh, more variety in the market of the foodstuffs, particularly fresh fruits, uh, international. Mm. Uh, we, I remember in those days, it's very rare, but a very good treat. We can get sun-kissed orange. <laughs> <laughs> from California, mm. and it was very well. We we didn't have. I mean, the oranges in in China, for example, a different type, yes. uh, but not as as good as the <laughs> California ones. Mm. Yeah. So that the we were beginning to taste some of the fruits of of the seventies. Uh, mm. Yeah, alongside with my family, my father started moving away from the factory mm. production into the retail, mm. uh, setting up two uh, retail shops, uh, selling shoes. So our family mm, sort of gradually improved uh, the standard of living. Mm. Did you feel, and your friends feel, Chinese? Mm. Or did you feel somehow that you were separate by then? Ah, the identity is very interesting. We've been told uh, that uh, we are Chinese, mm. and there's no uh, no difficulty uh, acknowledging that, because mm. we mean we we are Chinese. But uh, every day we we come across uh, a lot of different people. I mean, there's still quite a bit of uh, British mm. people. For example, at school. Mm. I, I, we still had a large number of English uh, teachers mm. uh, at Yinghua and of course Mary No, uh, and in society, police force for example, still a lot of police officers, uh, English or British, uh, the lawyers, courts, mm. uh, and even sometimes uh, immigration, uh, yeah, the border checks. I mean, you see, the, we call them guai <laughs> mm. uh, So the the outlook is, is very mixed. Mm. So we were asking ourselves, I mean, Chinese, mm, not Chinese, still still undefined. Perhaps we're still, still too young to give uh, very meaningful definitions. Mm. To, to such a big question. Hmm. You said um, when we were talking that it was still um, quite a corrupt place, yeah. but yeah. police force and so yeah. on. Can you uh, yeah. elaborate on that a little? The, um, <clears throat> the 60s and the early 70s were very bad because hmm. it's, um, well, even wide ranging, I mean, street level. Hmm. Uh, not just the police officers, but anybody in uniform. Mm. They just, okay, they walk past you, and then if you are selling newspapers, you're selling whatever, then you, you are expected that he can pick up anything and go without paying. 
and that that's the norm. Mm. And if you have to do anything with any government department, then you have to have some sort of licensee. Mm. We call it lucky money, mm. ready, uh, and then that would open you the door, or give you a. Uh, the, the position in the queue perhaps a little better, that sort of thing. So it's very wide uh, ranging corruption. Mm. Well, we didn't, well, we were sort of very street level mm. still, so we, we didn't know what was happening above. But do you think uh, uh, higher up also there was a lot of corruption? Yes, no doubt, because later on, I think it's shortly be- before 1977, when the ICC, Independent Commission Against Corruption, was established. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> that some high-ranking police officers were arrested mm. and some as- absconded before their arrest. Uh, that we learned that, ah, I mean, mm. it's not just the low level. Mm. Um, so, well, we, we were kind of helpless. I mean, we, we accepted that that was perhaps Mm. how things were done. Uh, but then the ICC started to do a lot of public education, mm. that that is not what you should accept. Mm. And, and life should not be uh, <clears throat> this way. And mm. government should respect the law mm. as well. Uh, and the law is everybody is equal mm. before the law. So when you're in a queue, then you're in a queue. So nobody jumped the queue. Uh, so we, we started to learn about these things. Mm. Uh, and no doubt, I think many of the government departments started to practice that mm. as well. So now it's mm. fairly uncorrupt, is it, in that way? Yes, because it's. Uh, I worked in, perhaps we'll have time to talk about that later on. Mm. I worked in the police force mm. for a while. I worked in the prisons. Department for a while. Let's talk about that. A lot of other government departments is basically non-existent Mm. now, because it's. um, I think two um, two things have worked from the uh, late seventies to now, is is the procedures, Mm. the transparencies, Mm. so the members of the public, for example, getting a driving license. Mm you know how it operates. It's very transparent. So you go there, you can post in an application and it says that you get your uh, license back in 10 days time or whatever it is. Or you go line up in the uh, transport department licensing office and you see 20 people ahead of you, then too bad. And they close at five. Then if you're too late, you're too late. You come the next day. You can't just mm. give a license and, and get into mm. queue no more. Yeah, yeah. And you, I think you mentioned that also at that time, mm. and possibly still, mm. there was organized crime. Yes. There were the, the triads. Yeah. And can you tell me something about that? Ah, that, that's very similar. It's, it's kind of like um, cat and mouse. Mm. So they, I think they have to rely <laughs> one on the other. So it's still there. The cat's still there, the mouse still there. The cat is the police. Yeah, or the ICC or yeah. the law enforcement or the prison officer. Mm. Now, even in the prisons, mm. we know. I mean, who is the big brother? Mm. When we, we check all of their history before mm. or on, on a uh, reception, uh, mm. when the court sentenced somebody to prison, then on the first day we had all of the, their dossier. Uh, so we know exactly who he is. Mm. Um, so we we have our own way of dealing with these people. Mm. Basically, it's separation. Mm. So we separate him from the rest of his gang mm. in the same prison or put them in different mm. prisons. We separate him from the other bosses of mm. the different gangs. <laughs> You can't put them <laughs> together in the same uh, workshop. Mm. Um, so still they're very much alive. Is it? Mm. Interesting. Mm. So um, how did you do at university? Ah. Now, not too bad. I was aiming at a first. Mm. 
to be very frank, mm. failed. Got the two first. Two one. Mm. Yeah. I I did um well we we got to do eight papers. Mm. So I, I did four English literature mm. and four comparative literature. Mm. Uh, which means um doing English translated works of mm. European and some Japanese or Asian texts. Mm. Uh, and one paper on the uh, sort of latest thinking at the time, structuralism. <laughs> I think it was quite big in the uh, yeah. 70s. I remember. <laughs> yeah. So we did, um, again, English uh, translation of uh, Darida, mm. the Ferdinand de Souche, mm. the linguistics based, um, mm. and so on and so on. Um, I think that was very fascinating uh, and, and added another dimension to the traditional uh, mm. an analysis of uh, Shakespeare, for example. Mm. And then Gerard Manny Hopkins, I mentioned, mm. the very uh, wide, well, eyes wide, mm. uh, the very technical bit. Uh, with, Strong rhythm. And yeah, tone. with the uh, insight. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps more about that some later occasion. Yeah. This is... Um, I, because of that, I think I won uh, two prizes. Mm -hmm. Now one uh, Croucher Shakespeare Prize, mm -hmm. and one Bank of America English uh, Literature Research Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, doing Gerard Minnie Hopkins. Mm -hmm. uh, so those two are my favorite mm -hmm. <laughs> poets. So, I mean, in some ways, to me, it's strange that someone sitting in Hong Kong should find a, an Irish Catholic poet so much to their heart. But he obviously did affect you. Yes. Well, is this, um, <clears throat> what do you call it, Inscape? Yes, Inscape. Yeah, so it, it's, it's so, so new. Mm. It's, it's so fresh. Mm. Um, this first big work, we did Sister Agnes Todd, uh, the wreck of the, the Deutschland. Deutschland yes. Yeah. Um, so hard, we call it, uh, strung, uh, mm. rung. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know it very well. I did yeah. A, a level yeah. Gerard Manley Hopkins yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, I love his poetry. I think it's Kibo, I'm not sure, Oxford. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So um, you didn't do as well as you hoped. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was good enough to do what when you finished? Well, it's, it's again, and uh, <clears throat> later on, I, I <clears throat> sort of looking back, mm. and the thing is, my friends told me, I wasn't aware at the time, <clears throat> by the uh, third year, mm. well, we we stayed in, in a hall residence mm. called Ritchie Hall, mm. uh, the Irish, <laughs> another mm. Irish, uh, the the uh, uh, Jesuits mm. uh, Hall of Residence called Ritchie, uh, following uh, Matthew Ritchie, mm. uh, the Jesuit. Mm. Um, very famous for their activity, mm. sports particularly. So in the first two years, perhaps I didn't spend uh, enough time mm. in, in the whole life. Mm. So they encouraged me I mean, you are here, you're part of our family, why not? You, you're you sort of not being sort of in the group enough. So perhaps I was spending too much time <laughs> on Shakespeare and, and the other things. So I decided to change a bit, mm. uh, picking up, um, well, in fact, I've been doing a lot of uh, sports uh, in earlier days, mm. uh, distance, long distance running, for example, stop that. Um, started doing uh, hockey and, and the rest uh, mm. in my final year. So, so mm. you can imagine <laughs> the, the result of uh, spending more time mm. in, in the fields. Um, um, so perhaps that affected a bit the, uh, the exams. Mm. So I didn't realize that at the time. I thought that I, I could manage both, mm. but apparently not. <laughs> didn't regret it though. Mm. Yeah. So what, what, uh, what kind of jobs were uh, open to you once you finished your degree? Ah, 
that again perhaps is related to uh, this final year change. Mm. I was the first one was my preference doing a master's in the United States mm. because I got an, a Banger American scholarship mm. um, for for Gerald Manny Hopkins. So I, I like to continue uh, in America. So I wrote the applications and so on. Uh, but in those days, uh, we weren't uh, sort of, um, <clears throat> my family couldn't support me mm. to that extent because it's quite expensive. Mm. Uh, so in the end, it didn't work out. Mm. Um, at the same time, I've applied to uh, do uh, the job uh, called uh, an administrative officer mm. in the uh, civil service. Governing Hong Kong. Yeah, that, that is a sort of definitive work mm. by, by somebody from so, Oxford, in uh, fact. Steve yeah. Tsang. I don't know him, but... He, I know him, and, yes. I, he's always yeah. on television all the yeah, time, yeah. being very anti-Chinese. Yeah, so, so that's the, uh, his work uh, on, on uh, how the uh, <clears throat> administrative officer was involved in governing Hong he Kong so mm. yeah, until ninety seven. Mm. Anyway, I, I I read not not at the time, but I read the uh, advertisement mm. um, that okay, I mean if you are bright and so on and so if you have a heart for Hong Kong, then go for it. So I did. <clears throat> uh, and then the third thing is kind of a safety valve. Mm. Uh, I applied to do an executive trainee in Cathay Pacific. Um, I remember now the first one in America didn't work out. The second one, uh, administrative officer, I, I didn't work out first time. Mm. I tried in 1979, the year of graduation, didn't work out. Uh, the uh, Cathay Pacific, I also remember very vividly, it didn't work out. Mm. So I, I didn't work any of these. Mm. Now, why? Uh, well, perhaps again, lack of experience, mm. and perhaps too uh, too honest. I mean, was mm. there such a thing as being too honest? I don't know. Um, I was asked at the end of the third interview, Cafe Pacific. Well, later on, I found out that if you are interviewing for a job and if you ask for a third interview, that means they like to hire you. Mm. I didn't realize that. Mm. At the end of the third interview. I still remember somebody called Linus Jung, who later on went on to be the CEO of Cathay. He asked me, um, if we offer you the job uh, today, would you take it? So I honestly replied, no, because I, my first preference mm. was still America. Yeah. My second mm. choice is doing no. This job, this is more or less a sort of mm -hmm. safety. So he said, thank you. And then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so so I didn't have any job. Mm -hmm. Come September, a week passed. Uh, I think it's the Sunday or, or the first or the second Monday in September, 1979. I'm not sure. Uh, got a call because I, I was sort of doing nothing at home, no job, mm. um, <clears throat> although with a degree. In those days, a, a degree was quite, quite uh, meaningful, getting a job. Uh, somebody, uh, appointment service, University of Hong Kong called. Mm. Uh, uh, there is a teaching post in Daibo, in the New Territories. Mm. In those days, about um, 45 minutes train ride, mm. quite far away. Uh, 25 miles from, from town. Um, you like to take it? So again, without hesitation, I, I said yes, because mm. I've got nothing to do. So I went there to teach English for a year. And then, of course, I believe in Providence. Mm. <laughs> uh, he made it. Uh, I met your wife <laughs> there mm, during that she, year. Was she teaching that? Uh, music. Mm. Yeah, and so marriages are made in heaven. Mm. 
So you married? Yeah. Uh, 1983. Mm. Yeah. And um, did the year go well? No, not too bad, but uh, well, no experience teaching. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then I was teaching mainly, they had two streams, one Chinese stream mm. of sort of English standard poorer mm. kids, the other English stream. I, I was teaching form one mm. Chinese stream mm. or committal one. You can imagine they, some of them couldn't actually uh, do the alphabet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so very hard times mm. trying to teach them English. So you, you're not allowed to use Cantonese. Mm. Also, I don't know how to teach English in Cantonese. <laughs> <laughs> so so mm. quite bad. I mean, not, not too easy. Yeah. yeah. And then what happened? We attempted the government mm. administrative office. No, I learned the, the trick now, mm. or perhaps that's not the word to use. Mm. Uh, so to do the uh, interviews and the exams again, mm. And then I was asked this question again. I mean, if we offer you the job, mm. will you take it? Of course, I said yes mm. <laughs> this time. Uh, so, so I got it. Mm. So it's 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, step into uh, government secretariat, mm -hmm. and then started my 37 years in the civil service. You've been in there 37. Um, where did the police, was the, was the police and the prisons, that was part of the civil service? Yes, yes. I see. Yeah. Um, how different do you think the civil service in Hong Kong, when you joined it, mm -hmm. was from the civil service, as far as you knew or now know, of uh, England and mm -hmm. the homeland? Several <clears throat> major points. I think one is the composition. Mm -hmm. uh, the word is localization. Mm -hmm. uh, when I joined in 1980, as I said earlier, a, a mm -hmm. lot of the more senior positions mm -hmm. were occupied by British or English uh, civil service yeah. people. And of course, the top ranks, uh, the governor, the uh, secretaries of the uh, policy bureaus and so on, so all British. Yeah. Uh, when it... <clears throat> Towards the mid 80s, mm -hmm. when the British uh, started to negotiate the future mm -hmm. with China, then the localization began to pick up. Mm -hmm. So we started to see a lot more local or Chinese uh, mm -hmm. senior uh, people mm -hmm. in the ranks. Uh, so that's the first one. The other is the rule based. I mentioned mm. uh, in the early days, uh, I mean, there were rule books and rule books and so on, but they were not very user friendly. Mm. So you don't actually see them in practice. Mm. And what was in practice is the um, sort of guanxi and a lot mm. of little of sweet. Even, even when you joined, it was like that. No, no, I mean in the early days, yeah, yeah. in the early 70s, mid 70s, mm. before yeah. the ICC. When I joined in 1980, the ICC has been in existence for mm. some time. And the rules were beginning to be translated or being made user friendly. Mm. So the frontline uh, government civil servants, they knew they were taught mm. uh, how to put them in practice. Uh, for example, a lot use of the local language mm. and the forms were um, in Chinese as well, mm. uh, not just in English. Mm. Uh, so the, the public, they were able to understand better how to fill in a form, mm. how to make an application and what to expect after making an application. What if you are rejected mm. and what sort of channel appeal mm. there is. And if you suspect that there is some fishy business going on, you can call up the ICC Mm. And they can investigate that and so on. So, so we're in the even in the early eighties, mm. beginning to c come in. Mm. But then uh, history is a very interesting thing. Nineteen eighty-three, I think, 
uh, it started to uh, the negotiations. Mm. So that began to uh, sort of feature in the news mm. a lot, and began to fill up the heads of mm. everybody in Hong Kong quite a lot. So people's attention focused on the future, mm. uh, what 1997 is mm. going to bring mm. in, in uh, 15, 17 years time. Mm. Uh, and then people started talking about emigration. Mm. Uh, in fact, my parents, my family, for example, my elder brother uh, went to Canada Mm. 1969, not not because of this, mm. but because of the education opportunity. Mm. Uh, he couldn't get into a university in Hong Kong, not doing good enough. Uh, so he started, uh, or many family doing a similar thing, not, not for the emigration uh, uh, purpose mm. at the beginning, mm. but then they, they sort of mm. made uh, an opening. Mm. So similarly, my family. Uh, come, I think my parents went with my two younger brothers in the year 1987, mm. uh, a few years after the uh, negotiations started. Where did they go? Uh, Toronto, mm. in Canada. I think a lot of Hong Kong people did as well, yeah. Vancouver and Toronto. Mm. Um, and then the, the uh, economy, mm. uh, <clears throat> sort of quite bumpy. Mm. 1987 was also the year of the first uh, stock market crash mm. following New York. Mm. Um, so did quite a bit. Uh, well, by that time, I had the uh, opportunity of working in um, what they call um, Omelco, quite <laughs> quite an interesting name. It's called the Office of the Members of the Executive and Legislative Councils. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> in those days, it's, they call a very strange name called unofficial members. Mm. Uh, I won't spend time on explaining mm. the constitutional mm. setup in Hong Kong in those days. But they were the lawmakers. And they were, the executive council was, was the governor's cabinet, as it were. Mm. Um, so they were not elected uh, initially. They, they were the sort of representative mm. of the people advising the governor mm. on, on how to govern Hong yeah. Kong. And they had meetings. Um, <clears throat> and the legislative side, of course, they make laws. Mm. Um, but they had their own in-house meeting uh, once a week. And we had, we, we were staffers. Mm. Uh, so we had the opportunity of having the meeting together. We take notes and, and follow up. So come 19, uh, 1987, a few days after the crash, mm. uh, the Hong Kong market uh, closed for four days. Mm. Uh, it was about to reopen the next day. I, I remember we were at this meeting and they were told, the members were told by the senior member called uh, Sir S.Y. Jung, mm -hmm. uh, a senior member of the executive council, like the uh, chief advisor to the governor. Mm -hmm. uh, he came from the, called the cabinet meeting, as it mm -hmm. were, uh, returning from government house uh, and break the news. Uh, that the market is going to reopen tomorrow. That was about three o'clock in the afternoon, the day before. And then he also said the second point is the government would use public money to set up a fund to back up the market because he expected that the market after four days closure mm. would make a big dip. Um, so it did. Uh, and then that tie us over. This government, I've forgotten except the amount mm -hmm. of the government funding put into this fund to expect the, the, the crash. Uh, so that was 1987. So those days were not, not too good. Yeah. 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 I think we stopped at yeah. uh, 1987, 1987, which is a very particular 
year to me uh, career I, I got my first promotion yeah in the year 1987 from the basic rank mm -hmm. of uh, administrative officer to senior administrative officer within a year uh, no i mean from no, i see yeah. yeah seven in seven years time which was the norm i think yeah. in those days um and then i i got my first um, sort of acting appointment to the next higher rank mm. the following year 1988 mm. in the education and manpower branch mm. of the secretariat in those days it was called uh, mainly dealing with labor legislation mm. Mm. Uh, very hard work uh, my first uh, taste of law making mm. Uh, we we uh, started with the drafting instructions mm. to give to the lawyers stating the policy intentions mm. and in, in fact found out that that was very very crucial the, to the process of law making so you you've got to make absolutely very clear what your intention is mm. uh, for the lawyers to translate that intention into the legal language Mm. And then we, the next stage, of course, is to deal with the lawmakers. Mm. Uh, in those days, it's a, a lot more easier, I think, because mm. they, they are more reasonable and they don't have party politics, mm. um, which means that some are better than others mm. uh, in understanding what the purpose is. Mm. Some might have their own agenda. Um, but they, they never brought uh, sort of party politics into it in those early days. Mm. Uh, the first set of elections to the legislature were held in the year 1985, mm. uh, a few years back. So bringing in um, sort of people's representative, mm. like some of the famous names uh, before 97, uh, Martin Lee, for example. Mm. Uh, um, and others uh, will appear more frequently in the news later on. They, they were sort of passing on the voice mm. of the people mm. in the legislature. So in lawmaking, I think this is a very important element. Mm. For labor legislation, it's even more important because it's, it's all mm. the, the common people working in the factories, in the construction sites. The worst the situation I had to deal with uh, was accidents, industrial accidents, mm. say falling from height, mm. usually resulting in deaths, mm. very poor, usually is insufficient equipment mm. and education. Um, and then of course in, in those early days is the inadequacies of the laws. Mm. So we try to make amends. Mm. introducing, say, uh, a series of very uh, intricate systems of insurance, mm. making sure that every layer mm. of the process in, in the construction industry uh, well insured. Mm. So in case of any accidents, at least you have mm. some compensation. Yeah. We even thought of those uh, sort of cowboy contractors mm. uh, fly by night mm. uh, not doing any insurance and we even thought of uh, levying mm. a fund from each insurance policy mm. uh, to set up a compensation fund mm. for those uh, poor uh, workers who, whose employers don't buy them any insurance so those were very, very fruitful days. I mean, I felt uh, mm. having done something good for Hong Kong, bringing in the, a very comprehensive set of uh, uh, labor legislation. Mm. And that brought me to, in fact, very soon afterwards, my second promotion mm. in 1990. Uh, and that more or less, we, I then enter into my sort of mid career. Mm. Um, and it's, it's very interesting times, very, very more. What's the other word? Uh, interesting is too common. Mm. Uh, should I 
use the word unique because mm-hmm. I was very fortunate. <coughs> Uh, 1991. Mm. Well, everybody knows uh, what happened 1989 mm. in June mm. in Beijing. Uh, following, soon following that, uh, repercussions in Russia, mm-hmm. uh, bringing down, I'm not sure whether there is any causal relations, uh, bringing to the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. And the news was broken on the um, wire we used to have telegrams mm. from the fco foreign and commonwealth office to uh, all of the posts including hong kong and that telegram mm. was uh, i was at the time very fortunate my boss i, I was um, i was deputy to uh, the uh, press officer to the chief secretary um, the number two in in the government um, I was the deputy to the press secretary. Uh, the press secretary went on leave, so I was asked to occupy his room for the time being. The room was next door to the chief secretary, and there is this telegram machine mm. outside of my office. And my secretary came in one evening with this blue, printed on blue paper, this telegram from the FCO saying that the the Soviet Union, the USSR, as we know it now, <laughs> no longer. Um, and then following that, soon following that, I'm not sure whether there is any relation, uh, another telegram saying that uh, we will replace the governor. In those days, I think it was somebody called David Wilson. Mm-hmm. Uh, the successor was not named in that telegram. Uh, but we learn, and then we had to do some preparation for the PR mm. work to sort of soften the ground mm. of the reception of the news mm. when the news were formally made uh, soon afterwards. Uh, 19, come 1992, we, we know who's going to come. Of course, one Christopher Patton came, uh, and that started five years of very exciting times in Hong Kong. The last five years, I think he, Patton chose that as the title of his first address to the legislature Mm. uh, in Hong Kong, called Our Last Five Years. Mm. It's called the Policy Address. Mm. I think it it sort of like the Queen's Address to Parliament Mm. uh, every year at the start of the legislative year. And then he laid out very ambitious plans to bring democracy and elections to Hong Kong. Mm. Um, And then I had the fortune, misfortune, to be the only person in his sort of inner PR group dealing with the uh, propaganda warfare with China. (laughs) You you might have read about that in the news a lot in those days. Um, Beijing would fire a salvo of all sorts mm. in the morning in, in their uh, newspapers. Uh, um, well, not much television in those days, uh, or newspapers. And then all the local newspapers would follow. And then I was amongst uh, three, I think, of the more junior uh, in the team who know both Chinese and English. So. Patton would not wait until several hours later for the Chinese press to be translated Mm. into English for him to read. So we were asked to do a very quick translation every day Mm. of the gist of what Beijing was sort of telling him Mm. to do, what to do, what not to do. (laughs) So then he would think of uh, the appropriate response Mm when he stepped out of the office and being interviewed by the press. Uh, very exciting. Can I just go back a bit because it turned itself off? Um, can I ask the question mm-hmm. again? Uh-huh. What, what did you think of uh, Chris Patton? Oh, brilliant. Uh, he brought to Hong Kong uh, very new things mm. like dealing with the media. Mm. Uh, he had very skillful use of language. Uh, he knows how to uh, handle the media. 
uh, how to give them, what to give them, at what time. Um, so all of these were very new. Do you think his policy, mm. which was to be really mm. confrontational mm. with China, to mm. show that he, he didn't have much regard for it, that he wasn't interested in going there, mm. learning anything about China, mm. do you think that was a good policy? Uh, I think to be fair to him, and, and of course I, like so many other people, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, perhaps it's not exactly fair to him to comment uh, what I'm going to say now. I think he did what he had to do uh, at the time. I'm not sure whether he knew at the time what reaction mm. that would bring from Beijing. Of course, he quickly knew uh, that that was no go. Mm. Uh, and that was to the uh, to the eyes of the uh, powers that be in Beijing, that that was a bridge in trust, mm. a bridge in some of the tacit agreements made. Uh, in fact, there was part of this very intense propaganda war. Uh, there was, a, well, not a leak, I mean, intentional leak of seven letters or seven exchanges of uh, diplomatic uh, exchanges to the media and it's all published mm. uh, in detail detailing mainly how the new legislature the first legislature post 97 uh, was going to be made mm. uh, how the membership uh, and so on and so forth in great detail and how patterns uh, new blueprint uh, announced in the policy address i mentioned um, was entirely different, for example. Um, so we we can understand how the uh, the frustration, as it were, on on the uh, Chinese side in, in at the time. Do you think there was a breach of trust? Um, it's it's difficult to put a gloss on. If you read those seven letters, mm. then of course you would draw the same conclusion as everybody else who read those letters mm. as if the trust and the agreement was breached mm. but then there might be more evidence that that were not revealed yes now, but but what i was trying to say is that the impression yeah. i got yeah. is sort of a small potato in the mm. from the inside as yeah. it were uh, of him yeah. and the reaction that uh, in Hong Kong we got from his uh, first policy address mm -hmm. uh, and then following on from that yeah. uh, this propaganda warfare yeah. uh, resulted in the um, uh, sort of toing and flowing mm -hmm. of uh, <clears throat> relationships I mean ups and downs mm -hmm. uh, until the end of the uh, British rule in 1997. Yeah. So quite a few years of ups and downs. Uh, not just the political side, uh, but also the social side. Because mm. a, a lot of the policies, perhaps he was, one, one was worth mentioning, is a so-called retirement protection mm. that he had a mind of uh, introducing. What is called mandatory provident fund mm. is still in use today. Um, although it's, it's um, well, some some sort of academics would would call it to be um, or cosmetic. Yeah. Uh, in in truth, I think in substance, it, it's it is true. Mm. I mean, it's cosmetic. Mm. Uh, but it started. It's it's the first. I mean. Uh, the first of such um, formal scheme mm. of trying to uh, protect uh, people's retirement income mm. in in such a way. Uh, so you, you, I think, to be fair, you you have to have to give at least some credit mm. uh, to him for that as well. Uh, and in truth, as I said, uh, it doesn't make too much. Uh, of a payment mm. for for somebody's retirement, but it, it it's I mean, something is better than nothing. What did what difference mm. 
Um, many people in the West predicted that Hong Kong would crash. Mm -hmm. that at the moment it was separate, that the mm -hmm. stock exchange would crash, that everyone mm -hmm. would leave and mm -hmm. there would be disaster. Mm -hmm. What difference did you notice the day after? Um, oh, it's, it's, well, it's typical Hong Kong. Um, we, we laughed. <laughs> I mean, we, we've seen so many of these mm -hmm. in the past 50 years, 60 years. I mean, the Cultural Revolution, I mean, well, even that, mm -hmm. the, the Second World War, and so on and so on. Almost every 10 years or so, mm -hmm. we had something big. I mean, well, again, 87 seems to be a very interesting mm -hmm. year. The same year, I think, if I remember correctly, we had something called a, a nuclear plant mm -hmm. being built in Daya Bay, 50 miles or kilometers from Hong Kong, that was that sort of meant the mm. end of the world for Hong mm. Kong for a while. Mm. I mean, uh, and then 97 itself, of course, 10 years from 87. And then the um, 80, my well, 20, 20, sorry, 2008, mm. 2009, you have Lehman Brothers. Yeah. Um, so you didn't notice much difference in 97? No, 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 don't get me wrong. The the change is big. Mm. So it's, it's not as simple as what Dang said, mm. just a change in the flag. Mm. No, it's, it's not as simple as that. Um, of course, the police, they changed their insignia mm. on, on midnight from the uh, British mm. uh, coat of arms or mm. so, um, emblem to mm. the Chinese. Uh, and then, of course, the flat is lower, and uh, the it's not a sudden, it's not a not a sort of overnight mm. change. But I mentioned localization, I mentioned the use of Chinese, I mentioned the more widespread uh, involvement of the public mm. in sort of public affairs. Uh, people are more what do you call it, involved. Mm. Uh, they make a lot of complaints for some of that. That, in fact, is, is a good thing. Although from, <laughs> from a bureaucrat's point of view, you've got to deal with a lot of complaints every day, mm. spend a lot of time on the files. Mm. is not a good thing. But, but it's a good sign mm. that people care about uh, the, the place. Mm. So they don't like something happening, then they took the trouble to call or to mm. write uh, or, and then beginning to use email. Now, so people are beginning to get involved. And a, a lot of these were quite different mm. before uh, 97. Mm. Now, I, I also, <clears throat> well, we'll start on something new. Huh? When I was posted um, 1999 mm. uh, to do financial services, mm. now, that was the start of another big uh, step of the role of Hong Kong changing mm. after 97. It's, it's in those days, a top secret. Uh, the financial secretary the, um, and myself and others, some of the top uh, financial uh, services uh, officials, started many trips to Beijing to talk with uh, our counterparts in, in the Ministry of Finance, uh, the People's Bank, and so on. Now, mainly trying to pave the way for monetary instruments, renminbi denominated instruments, to be introduced into Hong Kong. Mm. Um, and then gradually, uh, after several years, uh, it became uh, fruition uh, that <clears throat> very new uh, financial instruments were introduced into the market <clears throat> in Hong Kong, into the banking system. Uh, gradually, then nowadays, of course, it's everybody's knowledge. You can actually trade the stocks and shares uh, in Hong Kong, of, of uh, and and then there is some connection between the. Uh, stock exchanges, Hong Kong, Shenzhen and what, Shanghai. What, what um, currency does Hong Kong use? Uh, now, of course, still Hong Kong dollar. Oh. Uh, 
it's been guaranteed uh, in the joint declaration and in the basic mm -hmm. law. So we we don't have to have uh, <clears throat> other currencies mm -hmm. and legal tender is still the Hong Kong dollar. Mm -hmm. But for a long, long time, I think since 1994, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. the Hong Kong Monetary Authority started a very far sighted mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. of uh, they call the uh, settlement system that you can actually, the bank system in Hong Kong can settle in three currencies, mm -hmm. in addition to the Hong Kong dollar, the US dollar and Euro uh, for a long time now. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way I think is now paved for one day to come uh, when the RMB mm -hmm. can be freely traded mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, uh, but I'm not sure <laughs> how long. Yeah, it hasn't. Uh, it isn't yet. No, no. Interesting. Um, so you were in the finance, you know, financial department. What was the next ah, uh, stage? Uh, in all? And then the um, prisons. Hmm. A very another very interesting uh, job. Um, I was posted to deal with uh, something called the mega prison project. Um, Somebody had a brilliant idea, land being so scarce mm. in Hong Kong, that okay, we had more than 30 prisons mm. in Hong Kong. The most famous of which uh, is called the Stanley Prison, my namesake, <laughs> mm. uh, in, in a place called Stanley, mm. at the tip of southern Hong Kong Island, occupying a big chunk of land. Mm. Um, and then some 30 or other prisons mm. scattered around, some on the island, some on the mainland, some in, everywhere. So somebody had the brilliant idea, why not just get rid of all of these prisons and build somewhere mm. one prison, good enough for all of the prisoners, mm. and then release all of this precious and uh, <clears throat> valuable land for development to mm. other more useful purpose. So I had to deal with that. Uh, and then the, the public had a huge cry against the idea because nobody likes uh, to have a prison, let alone a mega prison near their backyard. Mm. Uh, so I had to deal with that. Uh, so I thought, I told the Commissioner of Correctional Services, it's not, not, not called the prisons, it's mm. called Correctional Services. Um, okay, why not <clears throat> forget about this? Because you never get through the legislature, mm. never get the funding, because a huge mm. prison means huge sums of money, yeah. and then a long time to build. So it's not going to work. Uh, why not forget about that? and use that as kind of bargaining chip with the government for a series of what I call in-situ redevelopment. You, okay, you build some, find a good piece of land, sort of no man's land, mm -hmm. and start a new prison. Mm -hmm. And then you can move one of the existing prisons to that, mm -hmm. releasing that piece of land. Mm -hmm. And then you can return that to the government and so on and so on. So you do that. And that would be, I think, you piece by piece, mm -hmm. you have a much better chance of getting through the legislature, mm -hmm. getting the public's approval, because mm -hmm. it's small. Mm -hmm. You don't have uh, upwards of 10,000 prisoners mm -hmm. in the same place. Mm. Uh, so, in fact, that is still the policy today. Mm. Now, and that so, was your idea? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, so that, that's, I, I was there quite a few years. Uh, that was one of my uh, ideas. Mm. Uh, the other one is um, improving the rations. Mm. So, I mean, rations and meals is a big thing. Mm. I think the big thing in the prison. Um, so we had a very good tendering system. Mm. 
But again, somebody sometimes said, okay, it's always this tenderer. Perhaps you, something fishy. Mm. I mean, upwards of, I don't know, several decades. Mm. Why is still the same guy, the same company gets the contract? Mm. Why not change it? That's before my time. Mm. So change. It only lasted for one day. <laughs> Doesn't work. Because mm. he never got the logistics. Because, mm. I mean, 30 odd prisons scattered on all sorts of places in Hong Kong. The logistics is, is not easy. Mm. And to be there on time mm. and to have the correct amount mm. it is not an easy job. And there is a very small margin of profit. Mm. Uh, so after the day, um, quit it. Mm. <laughs> so I had to sort of recall as an emergency measure the old supplier. And then to buy time to do a new tender. So I restructure the way to, to sort of modernize mm. the diet and modernize the um, specifications uh, and to improve the tendering procedure to, mm. to make sure that uh, it's transparent, it's fair. Yeah. Uh, from time to time, um, there, 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 there are newcomers. Mm. Some, some are better than the old ones. For example, rice. Rice is a very important mm. element in mm. the diet. Um, a newcomer, uh, no doubt wanting to uh, get into it for the longer term. He plays a very good price in, in one of the tenders. And of course it was awarded because a very good price, very good quality. And then proved to be good uh, grain. Yeah. So in those days it's, it's a great improvement mm. for the rice uh, diet. Mm. Well, that was quite satisfying as well. You've done something <laughs> useful. So what was the next? Uh, the next of my, my retirement hmm. posting. Again, a very what un date unique uh, 2009. Yeah. For seven years, eight years, uh, yeah. Central Policy Unit, hmm. the government's think tank. Uh, we do three things, I think. One is to do the governor's uh, or the chief executive now, a policy address mm. every year. I was the uh, sort of editor. Um, the other is policy research, mm. um, looking ahead of time, uh, not duplicating what the uh, policy bureaus were doing. Mm. The third is to administer a public policy research fund, uh, helping the academics to do policy research. Mm. Uh, we, we just um, sort of administer yeah. the funding. Mm. They had total freedom to choose how and what mm. they do. So a very interesting seven years, eight years. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, work with uh, three, I think three chief executives uh, in that posting. One is Donald Jan mm. in 2009 from 2002, his uh, end of office 2012. And then CY Le from 2012 to 2017, I think. And then only for a month, the the last one, the Carrie Lam, uh, the month of July, I think she took office first of July, and then I retired uh, the end of July. <laughs> so I had so to go So you knew her. I mean, she's the one who's best known in the West now, yes. mm -hmm. and there are very mixed um, mm -hmm. assessments of how yeah. good or bad she was. She mm -hmm. earned a lot of. Um, vitriolic attacks from mm. various people, but mm. what was your impression of how, how well she managed? My, my, uh, what I'm going to say entirely is sort of my personal, mm. uh, personal in both sense, uh, from my own view, 
and then as a friend. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I think we uh, reported for duty as administrative officer on the same day, mm-hmm. 1980. And then a year later, she came here, I think, mm-hmm. Cambridge, for training. And then I went to the other place. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were sort of more friends than colleagues, uh, so mm-hmm. we seldom sort of talk about office. Mm-hmm. But well, I, I know her husband, mm-hmm. I know her children, um, and then we, <clears throat> how should I say it, uh, towards the last 15 years or so of our career, we seldom had the opportunity to meet. Mm-hmm because I, I sort of stayed uh, at a certain rank mm-hmm. in the civil service where she, of course, mm-hmm. rose further and further. So our paths uh, sort of mm-hmm. seldom met. So what I'm going to say is that my, my personal view of us, very, um, what do you call it, um, dedicated. Uh, she knows her stuff much, much better than all around her. Those above, those below, those uh, in parallel, uh, knows uh, in great detail everything here. Mm. So she doesn't have to Mm. (laughs) look at the notes. Uh, At meeting, she's very sharp. Um, So you can't... um, so to pretend that you know something that she doesn't because uh, she always knows uh, everything better than yourself. Um, but as a friend, uh, she, she's a very, um, she has a very good uh, distribution of time. Uh, she had in the early days in the family, she had, of course, to bring up two sons. I think I'm not sure. At least the first one, I think, went to college here. Hmm. Which one, I don't know. I think even the second son went to college here as well. Uh, so in younger children, she's got to be a mother. Uh, after work, she, she insisted to get off work at a certain time, hmm. not too late, hmm. uh, in order to go to the market hmm. uh, and then to uh, go home and do what mothers do. Uh, feed the family and so on. Um, then, not very often, but sometimes uh, our friends are a similar uh, vintage. Uh, we we have gatherings and we had uh, the social events, and so it's very um, we're just like any of our colleagues. Uh, so those are, are my impressions. Uh, but of late, of course, I I <laughs> read the news as well. Um, particularly in the more uh, difficult days about what, 2019 Mm. and thereafter. Um, Very, very dark times, not just for her. I mean, for us, as ordinary, I retired, uh, simple, mm, ordinary citizens. I mean, very difficult times in Hong Kong. I mean, you... I had the misfortune of actually running into some of these troublemakers uh, in black. I was attending a wedding. I live in Hong Ham after retirement near the railway station. I had to go to the uh, Cross Harbor Tunnel to take the bus to the Hong Kong side to attend the wedding. At the same time, my misfortune, I mean, two columns of black <clears throat> troublemakers, I call them. These are the protesters. I don't call them protesters. Mm-hmm. I call them troublemakers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> walk out of the Hong Kong railway station at the same time as me. Mm. And then they file in two columns, different directions. I didn't know at the time, but three minutes later, later I, I, I knew why. One went across the footbridge to the Hong Kong Polytechnic University and went down to the other side of the cross of a tunnel. This column went to the same side as I was trying to catch the 104 bus to Hong Kong. And they 
right we we met again right at the same time i was joining the queue mm. at the bus stop they were streaming down the stairs uh, immediately they they pushed the the meals barrier and the little bins onto the road stopping the buses at the same time the other side doing the same thing in fact later on of course i read the news and knew that uh, they were trying to blockade the cross harbor tunnel mm. and they did and then stop the uh, main artery of traffic in Hong Kong, at least for a few hours. I, I can't remember for how long. Mm. Uh, and then I had to walk. I immediately walked the other way. I had to catch the, uh, went to the other station called Jim Sa Chui East mm. to catch the MTR to go across the harbor. And that was my sort of close personal encounter with these troublemakers. What was behind? You say they're not protesters, they're troublemakers. I, de I detected <clears throat> that on the service, like the uh, so-called Occupy Central, whatever mm. it was, 2014, mm. yeah. I, I detected that uh, on the service, they were saying something very beautiful. Mm. That like, um, I'm not sure what were the slogans. Um, Freedom. That, that right. This is um, this is Hong Kong or this is our Hong Kong, something mm. like that. As if there were two or <laughs> more mm. Hong Kongs. Um, but I think that their true intentions, my my own point of view at the time, because i have been with the uh, police force, um, they were trained to uh, invite or to excite Inside. Mm. the uh, frontline police officers to use force, in particular to open fire uh, in order to create even more trouble. That, that was how I uh, made out much later on, not mm. at the time. Because later on, I didn't have the uh, fortune, misfortune of meeting them on the street. I, I sort of looked mm. at the news on television. Some of the tactics um, I can recognize. Sort of, because I think somebody taught them. Who? Mm. Uh, I don't know who. Uh, perhaps uh, former police officers, because they knew. Uh, under what circumstances uh, a police officer would be allowed to draw mm. their weapon and even open fire. So you can tell one incident I remember watching on television news that they surrounded one police officer mm. and sort of using, I don't know what, uh, rubbish bin or whatever mm. to, to sort of make him fall onto the ground and then use bricks yeah. trying to hit him on the head i mean the, these are very clear to me that these are uh, sure tactics uh, to to the colleagues perhaps 20 yards 50 yards mm. the, away the, i think indeed and if i'm not mistaken you can check the news on that same incident one police officer drew the revolver and fired at one shot mm. uh, at the sky, yeah. not, not at, the, at the protesters or wherever they were. And, and, and then sort of they, well, they scattered and, and helped the, save the colleague. If, if that, that was their tactic to try and mm. get the police to be violent towards them, what is the longer term aim or goal of these people? I, I can only conjecture because mm. I mentioned the 2014 incident. Mm. That was quite a good comparison. No such tactics were used mm. in, in that. Uh, that's a long time. I think they blockaded Central Admiralty Jim Sa Chui, I think, mm. and Mong Kok for two months, three months. And on the whole, rather peaceful. Mm. Um, and then they more or less the same sort of at least on the service uh, objective uh, 
trying to make a better Hong Kong and, and so on. Um, but quite different tactics, mm. uh, 2019 and, and those years. So perhaps the times have changed or, or so call for different tactics or they try this one didn't mm. work <laughs> and they've got to try something else. There's mm. been speculation that there was external mm. um, encouragement or mm. even training or financing, mm. maybe from the CIA or mm. elsewhere. Mm. Is there any evidence for that? I don't know, but, but it's, it's no secret. I think the chief executive at the time or, or the former now, I think by the year 2019, C.Y. Leung was the former chief executive. I think I might have mixed up 2014 and 2019, at least in the 2014 uh, <clears throat> incident or in series of incidents, he, he did use external or whatever is being translated mm. into English, or Ibo Silic in, in Cantonese, uh, external forces. Mm. He did use that term. So I don't know whether he had evidence or not. I, I, I don't. Mm. When I talked to a very senior British diplomat about this, mm. who was um, in Hong Kong uh, previously, and I put it to her that the kind of behavior that um, these people were doing, shutting the metro station and the mm -hmm. airport and um, going into the parliament and mm -hmm. so on, wouldn't have been allowed for one hour in England. Mm -hmm. If this had happened in London, mm -hmm. the police and then the army, if necessary, would have gone in and yeah. arrested them all, mm -hmm. and in America. Mm -hmm. And this person said, well, that's what they should have done. It was useless policing by the yeah. Hong Kong police. What is your answer to oh, that? Oh, I disagree. I, I think it's due to the very, very um, perceptive um, insight of those uh, in control at the time. Uh, seeing through that violence, force, is not the solution. Um, <clears throat> patience, the peaceful, the, you call it negotiation or you call it discussion, whatever it is. Uh, time, you write it out. Uh, and then, of course, you have to have to deal with uh, specifics. And on some occasions, as I mentioned, one, uh, you had to use uh, some warning shots, hmm. perhaps. But certainly, the police were very, very professional. Uh, and I, I, I had the fortune of working with them for a short while. And I know their training hmm. is... is uh, second to none uh, and their discipline again is, is I think perhaps uh, one of the best uh, police forces uh, not only in Asia um, Does that mean that now that um, as it were absorbing mm -hmm. and then coming back mm -hmm. approach means that Hong Kong is at peace with itself now mm -hmm. Has it had a long-term good effect? I, I think there is a price to pay. Um, well, I've been sort of relocated um, to this country for about five, yes, five, six years now. So I might have lost touch, uh, although I returned to Hong Kong from time to time, once a year. Um, the mood is certainly different. So people on the whole uh, can go about their, their business uh, without having to uh, sort of allow much more time for traveling mm. or for uh, sort of emergency alternatives to be made mm. uh, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there, there are people who don't like the um, sort of atmosphere that you are 
kind of somebody might use some of these emergency laws or whatever it is, uh, national security laws to uh, in the wrong way. Mm. Uh, but if you talk to people individually, uh, as I do, I mean, I have, of course, still mm. a lot of friends and relatives, that to the ordinary people, um, the the um, this is, I think, a price worth paying. That you have the uh, <clears throat> I'll call it the peace of mind mm. to go about your business on a day to day basis. Mm. For example, to be sure that the MTR works, mm. that the tunnel is free. <laughs> mm. And the buses come on time mm. um, to to sort of give up, if I can use that term, uh, that you don't make certain remarks mm. and you think uh, a lot more before you post certain uh, news or, or hearsay without uh, proof on the social media. Or some of these, uh, I read some of these um, persecuted cases in mm. the courts um, that these people perhaps are not um, as careful or, or as uh, you sort of due diligence to check beforehand. And they perhaps um, made um, sort of too rash uh, decisions mm -hmm. uh, for no particular uh, without sort of seriously thinking through uh, and and fell uh, prey to uh, this instant gratification <laughs> now, now prevalent uh, in the social media. So perhaps uh, we would have to uh, all live and learn. Mm. What What is your feeling about the future of Hong Kong? Mm. Ah, I always say, um, <clears throat> since... Um, the early days of my career. Hong Kong is, um, what do you call it? Uh, Chinese is, uh, in Cantonese is folk day. Putonghua is fu, uh, xin fu. Uh, <clears throat> I will translate that. Uh, there is not a very satisfying translation in English. It's not fortunate, it's, it's not fortune. It's some sort of uh, rich endowment, hmm. perhaps. Um, it is the meeting of uh, people, time, and place uh, in Hong Kong. Um, uh, 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 sort of richly endowed mm. in all three ways. I think it's still true today. In what way is it different from Shanghai, which also is a richly endowed as a meeting place of the East and the West? Ah, let me quote you one uh, incident, uh, my personal experience. 2009, <clears throat> I went to uh, Shanghai uh, on an official visit. Um, I was just posted to the correctional services, but I still remember uh, my financial services days. Uh, 2009, Beijing gave Shanghai the an critical uh, directive to become a financial center for the mainland in 10 years time. Uh, so the officials that met us, the municipal officials that met us, knowing that I've been with the financial services in Hong Kong before, uh, asked me very politely uh, that they have a lot to learn from Hong Kong. Uh, how to sort of accomplish what Beijing has given them, this task of becoming a financial center in 10 years. I think they did a very good job, although of course Hong Kong, not, not me, but a lot of my colleagues still in the financial uh, services worked together mm. uh, and gave them uh, some advice mm. and of course they are <clears throat> they are also uh, 
staffed by very brilliant people in Shanghai. I think even better people, I dare say, because they are much larger. They, in fact, had a much longer history of being international mm. than Hong Kong. They're a lot more international. If you go to Shanghai today, I mean, you would still find the architecture, for example, mm. which is absent in mm. Hong Kong. Even in, in Hong Kong's days, uh, we're still very much uh, in those in the early days, still very much just British. There is some Portuguese, some uh, French as well, mm. but not as cosmopolitan as uh, Shanghai. Mm. So I think if you look into the future, uh, if Beijing's uh, directive, I, I've lost touch, I'm not sure what the current uh, policy is uh, from Beijing well, it's been to Shanghai. reinforced because Xi Jinping has just been in Shanghai mm -hmm. and encouraging them in this direction further. Because mm -hmm. in uh, 2009, the idea was for Hong Kong to go international mm -hmm. and for Shanghai to sort of domestic. Uh, so I'm not sure whether that's no, been, it's, it's changed, changed it's now. Mm -hmm. um, what effect did the rise of Shenzhen mm -hmm. have on China, uh, on Hong Kong? Sorry, the, well, the rise of Shenzhen. Ah, ah, that's Kong. very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I I was in Hong Kong uh, two months ago. I particularly made a point of visiting Sh uh, Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two friends living there actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hong Kong people retired. I chose to live in Shenzhen. <clears throat> so I visited them and show us around. Mm. I think they live frogged. I think I, I ought to use that word. They live frogged uh, a lot of the uh, difficulties mm. or valuable experience or, or mistakes mm. that Hong Kong made or other places made in the process of modernization. For example, the e-electronic payment, mm. uh, widely used, mm. uh, even more so than in Hong Kong. I mentioned over lunch. Mm. Uh, in Hong Kong, a lot of the taxi drivers, I think less than 1% would accept electronic payment. Mm. They, they still accept cash or they prefer to have cash. Um, so Hong Kong still, I mean, we, we've got a lot to catch up. Mm. So some gen, I, I think, will, will they don't have to, I, I think they won't look back. So you feel Hong Kong is rather old fashioned and British? Uh, no, uh, perhaps I, I ought to balance that uh, impression a bit. I think we, from the, say, the artistic, mm. yeah. uh, uh, let's go into uh, some detail. Uh, as you know, my wife uh, is a musician. Mm. Uh, my daughter is a, a sort of movement artist, or she lives here. <clears throat> in in the arts, uh, particularly the performing arts, <clears throat> I think I think we are still very much uh, innovative. We encourage uh, innovation. We uh, sort of have have the uh, opportunity for uh, collaboration, for the mix of different art forms, uh, still very much alive. Uh, and I think that that's one uh, point that, that going forward, uh, mm. Hong well, Kong can see. Filmmaking, yes. Yeah. Financial services, of course, because uh, we are, we are, I think most of the big uh, banks around the world are represented in mm. Hong Kong. The uh, Hong Kong dollar uh, is still packed against the US mm. and guarantee in the basic law. Um, and the renminbi uh, is going into uh, international, uh, although of course there's no, no, no sort of prediction as to mm. how soon, how, how. So a lot to do for Hong Kong in, mm. in this area still. Mm. Um, and then <clears throat> the um, how how we um, try to encourage uh, cooperation with our neighbors, 
not just uh, the mainland China, uh, what do you call it, the Big Bay yeah, yeah. area, mm. there's great potential. Mm. Uh, but also our international uh, connections. Mm. Uh, South, Southeast Asia, for example, uh, Japan, uh, further afield, mm. uh, because of our British uh, mm. connections uh, with Europe and even America. Uh, those are still very strong points uh, going forward mm. for Hong Kong. So I think, um, although Shenzhen, I think in time, I think we will find our respective niche in the Big Bay area. Mm. Um, apart from Shenzhen and Hong Kong, uh, on the west of the Pearl River estuary, mm. uh, Macau is an interesting mm. neighbor. It's a long, much longer history mm. to Hong Kong. They, they, they have found their niche. Mm. They have a very unique Portuguese culture. Mm. Um, and they have very good uh, infrastructure for tourists mm. um, and so on. A, a small place, but it's still, well, I also, we, we also made a point to mm. go there for a day trip <laughs> uh, mm. two months ago. Now, still fairly vibrant, mm. Macau. Mm. We didn't have time to go to Zhuhai. Mm. I heard that there's still, because of the bridge, mm. uh, is also very developing very well. Mm. And I also ought to mention the bridge. In 1995, I didn't have time to mention that. I had, again had the fortune of being the secretary to the Sino-British Infrastructure Coordinating Group, mm. uh, which started planning for the bridge. Mm. as well as other air traffic control in the Pearl River Delta and another sea channel from Hong Kong into uh, Shenzhen. Um, so it's very satisfying, mm. and repeating that word. When I landed in Hong Kong five years ago, when the bridge was uh, commissioned, and then is by the new airport. Mm. Actually, see <laughs> mm. the bridge. The, when I when I participated or well, part of the planning mm. back in 1995. Very satisfying. Yeah. So you've had a very satisfying life. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank you very much indeed mm. for a, a very satisfying interview. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Alan.